All right. Uh, good morning. For those that uh, are just joining in, didn't make the uh, the session that we had before. I think we got some of these technical uh, difficulties under control here. Um, using a new software and some new equipment. So uh, hopefully we, uh, we're working a little bit better here. If you can't hear me, obviously scream out. Uh, Lawanda is listening also. Uh, she's going to scream out if we're not able to, able to hear me. So and uh, we should be sharing my uh, PowerPoint presentation right now. So if you can't see that, also uh, chime in on either chatting or, or uh, let me know that uh, you're not able to see something. So good morning. Just want to uh, wish everybody a good morning on this Friday morning. Um, hope everybody's doing well. I would imagine most of you are working from home like, uh, like I am, even though this, this presence looks like I'm uh, actually in the office. I'm, I'm quarantined at home right now, too. Uh, we've got a friend that uh, has been not feeling too well, so we, uh, we decided to sit it out for a few days to make sure that we're not passing anything along. But uh, if you guys need anything, um, please don't, don't hesitate to reach out to us at CRT. We, you know, water, toilet paper, anything else like that, if we can help out, we, we'll be glad to help out. Um, as part of what we're doing is the whole goal behind this was to kind of uh, take over some of the uh, lag or lull in training that was available right now. One of the, the big schools that I used to love to go to and still go to every year is Isham. That's not going to happen this year. And there's a lot of, a lot of small regional training events that uh, are just not going on because of uh, the, the, the virus pandemic. So we're hoping to fill some of that gap and some of the time with uh, being able to present topics and measurement that are of interest to users that continue on in an education series. And uh, if you have ideas for topics, please email them to us. If you want to host, if you want to present a topic, we would love to have you help us out in doing this. There's so many different things that we can talk about when you think about the class structures at Isham and some of the other ones. There are literally hundreds of classes with hundreds of presenters and there's just a wealth of knowledge out there, and we just want to be part of helping to share that knowledge. When we're done with this, uh, these videos will be processed and they'll be put up on YouTube where you saw the calendar, uh, whether it was on our website or the links we had sent out. There'll be a new link that allows you to go directly to the YouTube video, or if you look on CRT Services channel, these videos will be up there also. Uh, brief introduction, my name is Brent Palmer. I'm with CRT Services and I am the manager of measurement technology, which uh, just is a role that allows me to work with different uh, measurement technologies and try to get them uh, integrated into customers and also support and look at new technologies that are coming down the road. Most of my life has been spent in liquids measurement, and with that, it's been custody transfer measurement. So allocation measurement was a little bit of a difference when I started to get into that, but uh, what we're gonna talk about today, our topic is proving, and it's a generic overview of proving, kind of what proving is, and just a common uh, couple pieces of equipment that we use in proving, what the goal of proving is, and maybe a few of the settings that we, we have in there. We're gonna expand out and do some more advanced proving courses uh, to go a little bit deeper. This is kind of the basics. Um, if you have questions, please uh, post them up on the chat here, or uh, at the end, I'll have a little question and answer session, and uh, you can uh, ask questions then. And if uh, somebody that's listening can answer those questions, if I haven't answered it correctly, or if uh, you can expand on what I'm saying, please chime in and uh, let's all share some knowledge here and uh, try, to, try to learn something today. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And we're gonna talk about proving. And specifically, when we do proving, what are we trying to do here? Well, uh, Meter proving is the physical testing of the performance of a liquid meter in a liquid service. What does that mean? It means that basically I have a meter and that meter has a K factor and that K factor tells us this many pulses is going to equal this much volume. Or I'm reading the totalizers out of a meter and that meter said it produced one barrel. Did it actually produce one barrel? Believe it or not, meters can be inaccurate. When they come from calibration from the labs and so forth, we call it in situ. It is basically the meter in its installation environment that these environmental effects um, 
have an influence on how that meter performs. So when I look at meters like turbine meters, the, the uh, flow profile, the way the fluid is traveling through the pipe, if it has swirl, if it has eddies in it, will influence how that turbine spins, which then will influence the, the performance of the meter. I may over-register, count too much product that didn't go through, or under-register. It also may be because of these physical meters, there may be performance issues. The bearings are starting to wear out. There's a nick in the blade, which affects the performance on them. On PD meters, there may be uh, the bearings and, and so forth are wearing out on those. In Coriolis meters, it could be that I'm getting coating on the tubings or there's damage or that, that meter has gone into a bind. There's pressure on either side of it that's affecting the way that it's vibrating. So all of this can affect the performance of the meter. And we prove these meters, one, to find out what their true uh, calculated quantity is. And number two, to find out, is there something going on with the meter? Am I starting to see wear on it? Is it not performing the way that I should? it should perform? Is it not performing across the flow rate ranges or in different densities the way that it should? So we're proving, and uh, the word's pretty good, it's we're proving that that meter is, is giving us the correct information. So we're testing that, and typically we're testing that against something that we know is good, whether that be a physical prover that has a calibrated section of volume that we can we water draw or gravimetrically uh, measure how much volume is in a, a, a calibrated section, or it could be against a master meter that's been proved and calibrated, and we know that it's giving us one pulse per barrel, or we know that it gives us 0.9988 pulses per barrel very accurately, and we can do a master meter proving where I prove it against another meter. So two different ways, and we're gonna discuss a few different proving options in here and a few different proving technologies. The main purpose is to deter, determine the accuracy of the meter. The basic principles of proving the liquid meter are the same, whether it's a Coriolis meter, a turbine meter, a positive displacement meter, that basically we're trying to prove a meter and we're trying to compare it against a measured section as we're moving product through it. So what, what are we trying to do here? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to determine the accuracy of the meter and with that, we're trying to determine what the uncertainty is. So you'll hear some terminology as we start going through and proving that we wanna see a repeatability. The repeatability basically is when I do a proving run, and what a run is, is basically I'm, I'm going and I'm measuring that meter against a measured section. So I got flow going through the pipe, I have some type of displacer, that when it starts in the measured section, I get a signal that tells me to start counting pulses. And when that displacer gets out of the measured section, I stop counting pulses. That gives me a, a run basically. And that meter gave me so many pulses and I know with the K factor that that pulse will then turn into a volume or a mass. Well, I also know in that calibrated section how much volume that is from detector switch to detector switch. I compare those two together and I do some corrections for the effect of temperature and pressure on the steel and on the liquids and come up with what the metered volume is versus what the prover volume is. I look at those two and that gives me a, uh, basically uh, a difference between the two. And I, I record that as a run. I do multiple runs and what we're seeing here is we have proving runs. And what we say is from the high to low, on these proving runs, whether I'm looking at the pulse count in each one or I'm looking at the derived meter factor, that I wanna see that that repeats from the high to low. So I can't have more than so much of a deviation percentage. So the repeatability limit is gonna be that I wanna see uh, three runs, and if those three runs come in, I wanna see the difference between the high and the low no more than 0.02%. If I do see they're within that, then that's gonna give me uh, an uncertainty. In API, we wanna have an uncertainty of 0.00027 or 0.027%. And what you can see is as we go along, if we put more runs in, my repeatability will be higher, but my uncertainty stays the same. So what this allows me to do is for meters that um, are a little bit more difficult to, to uh, prove 
in short periods of time or short sections of volume that we can do more and more runs and allow to have a, a greater repeatability limit, but it still gives us that same uncertainty. And this is basically right out of API. Um, it's a great read if you, if you enjoy reading API documents. Chapter 4.8, which goes into proving, um, this is where all this is based upon. So the first type of prover that we're gonna look at is a positive displacement prover, a, a ball prover, pipe prover. And what we have here is, this is a bi-directional ball. And we have fluid that comes in, and you can see at the bottom of the screen, we start off with a meter under test. And when that meter, fluid is coming through the meter, it comes up and we've got a valve, which was the prover bypass valve. We typically close that and it forces the flow into a four-way valve. And the four-way valve is gonna make the flow go in one direction. And in this case, the flow is going up and it's pushing the ball around until it gets to the other side. And then the fluid travels out and goes out of the prover. And we turn the four-way valve around and we send the ball back. So these are passes. And what we're doing is we're looking at the detector switch and we're looking at the pulses coming in and we're starting to count the pulses and we stop counting the pulses. And we do that between these detector switches. And when this, this prover is calibrated, water drawn, the volume between these detector switches is what's calibrated. So we know precisely what the volume between there is. It's done with water and with this displacer, this ball that's inside there. So as we travel back and forth, we can we know what the volume is and we compare that against what the meter volume is. And we turn these into runs as we're going back and forth. But the things we need to be concerned about on the four-way valve, do we have leakage? Do I have any fluid that's not truly all going past, the, um, going into the prover loop and back out, is it bypassing through the four-way valve or that prover bypass valve? Is it somehow bypassing and not going through the prover at all? Because the meter would be registering fluid, but if it's bypassing the prover, we're not counting it as we go through here. It has to push that ball around. So what happens is we have these, this ball, the green ball that we have here, and we have a detector switch. So when this ball is traveling in the pipe, there's a small plunger down at the bottom of the detector switch that the ball displaces that detector switch. It pushes it up. And inside, when that switch goes up, it hits a, a, a limit switch basically inside there. And we send a signal out of the switch that uh, then goes into a pulse counter or a flow computer. And then that's when we know to start or stop counting. This switch, again, is connected in the pipe, and we've got a probe that goes down in, and that probe has to be set at a certain length. And I'm gonna go back to the previous uh, slide here, because if you'll notice, that switch is gonna make at a certain point on that ball. So if I raise or lower the height of that switch, it's gonna influence where it makes on that ball, and that ball is being pushed by, by the product, and there's so much product in that pipe, in that measured section that's pushing it. So if I change one of these detector switches, in the height of that detector switch, I can influence and change where it's registering to stop counting, which could be a different volume. It doesn't seem like it's that much of a volume, but it can make a difference. It's, uh, it's very true when we get into the other type of provers, but they use a different type of switch. So API has guidelines about if you're going to change the switches that you have to read water draw the prover to, to recheck the calibration section. The same way if your ball becomes oblong or uh, distorted, that you may be triggering these detector switches um, at a different point. It actually also makes a difference in the forward and reverse direction. The volumes can be different depending on when these, these switches register um, that the ball is going by. So this is basically a detector switch. So here's the, uh, the function that happens when we go inside. So we've got a flow meter that's sending pulses out, a pulse train. Each one of these pulses is 
could be a blade on a turbine. It could be the blade off a PD meter. It could be a generated pulse coming from the Coriolis, but these pulses represent a volume or mass. So each pulse equals a certain amount of volume or mass that's going through the meter. On this pulse train, we start counting these pulses. Once they rise above a voltage threshold, we start counting the pulses when we see the start. The start comes down the bottom in correlation with the, the prover that this ball goes past the detector and the, the device sees the signal and then we start counting the pulses. When the ball gets downstream, we stop counting the pulses. We look at that, we consider that a run, we've got a run. We look at the, again, the calculate the volume of the meter saw by the pulses by K factor against the calibrated volume that gives us our run. And we're able to then start looking at run to run to run to see what the, the, the metered volume versus the prover volume is and come, with, come up with our calibration and our repeatability and all the other information that we do. But at its, at its core, this is, what, this is what proving is. We're basically going through a calibrated section and we're counting pulses along the way, starting and stopping them. So if I don't see a detector switch, I never trigger or I never stop counting pulses and we'll, we'll, we'll start timing out on, on information. Now, there's a minimum number of pulses that API says we have to have inside of approving to reach an uncertainty of 0.01%. And this is required by API guidelines. It's 10,000 pulses. A lot of times we'll see meters, especially Coriolis meters, people set them up to 10,000 pulses. And when we ask them why, they say, well, I need 10,000 pulses to prove the meter. So if you think about this for a second, and I'll, and I'll go back to this slide. If I need 10,000 pulses in a proving run to prove a meter, I'm saying basically that my K factor is 10,000, which means I have to have 10,000 pulses to equal one barrel. That also means that my prover has to be one barrel, right? I have to be able to displace one barrel product to generate 10,000 pulses. Well, if I'm using small volume provers, odds are they're not gonna be a barrel in size. That I, I'm not gonna be able to generate 10,000 pulses anyhow. So my K factor is set to something that, that really doesn't correlate through. So there's no, there's no correlation there. Of, uh, there is a correlation, I should say, that, that um, you, you basically on these Coriolis meters, the goal on them is to set the K factor at a proper interval so I'm getting the best resolution off the meter that I can be. So I don't wanna max out the frequency coming out of the meter, but I wanna make sure that I'm getting as many pulses out of that meter as I possibly can. And sometimes that K factor may be higher than 10,000 that I can use to get uh, better uh, grand granularity out of that meter or better representation out of that meter. Sometimes it has to be less because my flow rates in the meter is so large that I'm pushing so much product through. I can't do 10,000 pulses because I oversaturate or I, I, I've overloaded the output of the meter. So 10,000 pulses, where that comes from a lot of times is this requirement of API that I need 10,000 collected for an uncertainty when I'm proving, but it doesn't mean that just because I put it in as a K factor that I'm gonna get that on my proving. I have to look at my whole proving system to see that that happens. Turbine meters, PD meters, you can't set them to 10,000 pulses. They come with the K factor stamped on the side of them. So we have to use what's called pulse interpolation or double chronometry. And basically what we're doing is we're doing a mathematical equation um, to increase the number of pulses. So again, pulse interpolation or double chronometry. So it's double chronometry still, it allows for gathering less pulses by still keeping the uncertainty at uh, 0.01%. So when we do double chronometry, what we're doing is we're, we're basically doing a couple time periods and uh, we're starting and stopping the signals between two, these two pulse trains that we, we have uh, created inside there. 
And then uh, the, flow, the flow module determines the number of meter pulses that correspond to the measured start and stop signal. So basically I'm starting two times in and I'm counting, measuring the time between the pulses and the time in the pulses. And then I'm saying that the whole pulses times the time A divided by time B is an interpolation of that. So when we turn on double chronometry pulse interpolation, we're adding this into it. So if I have a meter that I'm able to produce 10,000 pulses on, I don't have to turn on double chronometry. But if I am, if I can't get that, if my, if basically my, look at your prover and you've got your K factor set at 10,000, 10, if I can't, if I come in with a prover that's not one, at least one barrel, you're not gonna get it and you have to do double chronometry. So the next type of prover where we typically have to use double chronometry is a, uh, you'll hear them called as small volumes provers, uh, piston provers, compact provers. Compact prover is actually uh, a more relevant term because uh, this can be a large volume prover, it can be a small volume prover, a ball prover can be a small volume prover. Small volume prover, again, is anything that's, that doesn't generate at least 10,000 pulses off your meter. So I can have a 16 inch meter with a prover that a helical meter and a prover that doesn't allow it to generate 16 or uh, 10,000 pulses. So it's a small volume prover. I've seen 24 inch provers that are still considered small volume because of the size of the meter and the K factor of the meter. You just can't get the volume through them. But basically on these, these uh, uh, piston provers, what we have is a measured section that is inside, uh, you can see the, the, the hollow through, where the piston and the uh, poppet are. And what happens is, is fluid comes into, it starts traveling down and the poppet is, when it's downstream, it's open and it allows fluid to keep on going back through. Over in the, uh, the, the mechanical section over to the right, this is all connected to a rod. So when we go to prove, what we do is, we take the, uh, we take the uh, start signal and we start dragging that piston back and the poppet's still open. Well, when it gets all the way to the end, the poppet closes and the fluid starts displacing and moving the piston downstream. Over on the right-hand side, there's actually uh, flags that are on that piston rod and there's an optical switch. So as that piston rod travels, it hits a switch when the piston and poppet are in the measured section. So we see that first switch to start counting. There's another flag on the rod that actually keeps, that as you're moving forward, when it gets to the end of the measured section, it hits the second detector switch and we stop counting and then it travels downstream, the pop it opens and then we drag it all back again. So this is one manufacturer, the Magnum Proof uh, by Meter Engineers. Uh, Honeywell makes a compact prover. They actually, this, this one is a magnetic couple that draws the piston back. Um, Honeywell uses a chain drive system, and then you have meter engineers, which uh, uses an encoder motor and a uh, belt drive system to pull it back. And there are optical switches. They actually put the optical switches on rods that are overhead, and they put one flag on the, on the, uh, the piston rod, and it goes, travels through the optical switches. As where this one has the optical switches, and it kind of travels through the, uh, through, through the flags. Uh, a little bit of a difference. So piston prover, this is what we're doing. Obviously, what can go wrong on, all, on, on this side of it? Well, you've got seals on these pistons that can go bad. So depending on the product that are through them, uh, they can start wearing out the piston. But you have uh, maintenance procedures and checks that you can do to make sure that the pistons are, are correct. Uh, what's nice about these, they take up a, a lot less real estate and room. They're easy to put on trucks. And uh, a lot of customers are going uh, this direction with, uh, with going with uh, compact or piston provers. The, uh, the function is still the same, that what we're doing is we, now we have optical switches. And these optical switches with this flag, again, we've got a calibrated volume. As fluid comes in, when we drag the piston down uh, upstream, once that seals, the poppet seals, then the, the rod starts going down. We hit an optical switch to start counting. We're counting our pulse train. When we get down to the end of the end of the measured section, the calibrated section, 
we hit B, we stopped counting pulses, and then we determine the number of pulses that we had through, and that comes up with our proving. So same philosophy, we're just not using a ball displacer, and uh, we're now using a, a piston, and instead of the switches being inserted into the stream with the ball displacing them, we're now using optical. Uh, one of the benefits of using uh, optical switches is on mechanical switches, depending on the velocity of the ball going through, those switches can do what we call slap. And basically what happens is they go through and they chatter. So we hit it, the ball goes through it, bounces it up, and when it comes down, it can make a couple different times. Uh, and it's called bouncing, uh, chatter, and we put in the flow computers at times a debounce cycle to basically say, well, ignore any chatter on that uh, for two tenths of a second or so forth, so we don't see that. With a uh, small volume prover that has optical switches, you can usually set that to zero because there's no chatter that comes with the optical switches. But because they are optical, one thing you do want to be aware of is when you're proving, make sure that you close the covers, the lids on these provers, because you can have uh, glare or sunlight or something coming in that can affect uh, the way that they can see these flags going through there. So typically the way that they're machined, you can replace out an optical, one optical switch without having to rewater draw. If you're changing out two of them, then it is recommended that you rewater draw the prover again. But um, uh, these switches, they, they really don't fail all that often across manufacturers. So, and that is, in a nutshell, uh, using provers and uh, how the provers function within a, a system. You usually have another part of this system, which is going to be the flow computer. And we're not going to do questions quite yet. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share a different part of my screen. And we're going to share and take a look at inside of a flow computer. What happens when we do proving and kind of some of the settings? Well, in this flow computer, we can go in and we'll start doing some prover operations where we want to start the prover and basically it's telling me which meter do I want to prove, uh, what's my status, I'm idle, I don't have a permissive, this last time it, repeat, it uh, failed on repeatability. And we can go through and we can, we can see a bunch of information in here. What I'm looking for in my uh, prover operation is, I'm looking for some things that I want to set up inside of there. What is the maximum number of runs that I'm going to allow the, the prover to operate at? Well, in this case, I'll set it to 30. So I'll allow this thing to do 30 runs. How many passes equal a run? Now, a pass can be that piston going from upstream to downstream. One pass can equal one run. Or I can say, no, 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 make the piston go two times. I want to measure it two times and add those together to make one run. Or maybe it's the ball prover and I want it to go forward and reverse, forward and reverse to make up a run. So multiple passes can be put into a run. I add more volume in. How many required runs do I need to be successful? We said that we wanted, um, before we were looking at, uh, we wanted to see five runs and I wanna see them at 0.05%. So I need five runs, which means that if I see five runs, within a maximum of 30 runs that fall within my repeatability, then I'm gonna consider that a successful proof. Doesn't mean that my meter factor is great, it just means the repeatability between runs is within my limit that I put in there. And do I have double conometry and then um, some flow computers allow you to have multiple volumes. So I could put multiple switches and have multiple volumes on a prover. This is my repeatability or my uncertainty. Um, we allow you to do, uh, in the FlowX, it allows you to do a couple different ways. I can do repeatability based on the meter factor. I can do repeatability based on counts. So I'm looking at the repeatability on the difference in counts, the number of pulses, or the derived meter factor. And then when I'm looking at my repeatability, do I wanna do it by the repeatability or I do, do I wanna do it by uncertainty? So I can say, I don't really care about the repeatability. I don't care if it's 0.05%. What I care about is when I derive that new meter factor, um, I wanna look at the difference between the runs and I wanna see uncertainty. 
So I'm going to let this thing go for up to 30 runs. And as long as I get an uncertainty of 0.027%, which is API what I want, I'll let it run. And API addresses how to use uncertainty. And, and really, we're seeing a shift in the industry of, of starting to get away from run repeatability and go to uncertainty. So uh, do I want to implement a new meter factor? And then we can start doing some tests within the meter factors to see if there are limits or what they're good. Or is, it good uh, is it a good factor at all? Just because I have repeatability doesn't mean that my factor is good. It may have shifted so far off. So I want to look at my previous meter factor. So I want to see that, uh, I want to see that meter factor within so close to my previous meter factor. In this case, 0.25%. Or maybe I want to look at my historicals and I want to see that within the last 10 provings, that I don't have a drift of the meter factor more than 0.25% from the last 10 averages. Because what can happen is I can look at my previous meter factor and I can change 0.2% and 0.2%. And I keep on changing by these 0.2%, which meet that previous meter factor test, but I'm drifting so far from what the base meter factor was when I first put the, put the meter in that I, I may be drifting way, way off. That meter factor may not be close to a one. It may be down to 0.98 and 0.97. And I am continuously drifting from that factor and it's showing wear on the meter. So it's a good indication of where when I'm, I'm starting to really drift off my main factor or an indication of something else going on. The end result is we get a proven report out of this and we look at those proven reports. We save the proven reports. Uh, some of you may have signed off on proven reports, but it's improving in a, in a, a just kind of a simplistic form. We'll do another uh, class where we get into actually the calculation of bringing in temperature and pressure and density and how that influences uh, doing volumetric proving. As we're with mass proving, uh, the temperature and pressure only affect the steel. There's no correction for liquids. So um, are there any questions I can answer? All right. Well, we're going to, oops, we actually might have one. Oh, no, no, sir. Thank you. Okay, cool. Well, I want to hope everybody has a great weekend. Hopefully we've got good weather to be able to get outside and not be near anybody. Um, uh, this will all pass, but uh, if there's anything that uh, we at CRT services can do to help with uh, any issues you may have going on right now, or you're looking at, uh, you need to put in some remote, remote, remote monitoring uh, equipment, um, Give us a call. We can greatly help you out uh, with anything that's going on. And in a couple hours, we'll have these videos posted up online and uh, for your reference going forward. And like I said, if anybody's out there that would like to uh, do some training classes and uh, have, or has some topics, please let us know and uh, be safe and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you.